My name is Richard Parks. When my rugby career was ended through injury, I became an extreme environment athlete. In just 197 days, I skied to the North and the South Poles and climbed to the top of the highest peak on every continent, setting a new world record. And that included Mount Everest, the most iconic mountain on the planet. Now I'm attempting to climb to the top of the world once again, but this time it's going to be even tougher. At more than 29,000 feet, there's just a third of the oxygen there is at sea level. But I'll be climbing without the use of supplemental oxygen. Without proper training and acclimatization, dropped onto the summit of Mount Everest, you'd be unconscious in four minutes and dead within six. Now the medical community in Wales is re-evaluating what they thought they knew about the human body, what we thought 40 years ago to be scientifically impossible. Could the way my body reacts to the extreme environment of the Himalayas provide vital clues to preventing one of the fastest growing diseases on the planet? Could Mount Everest hold the key to unlocking our understanding of dementia? It could well be, you know, one of the biggest escapes of my life. Every single item of gear that is here and that will be meticulously laid out and chosen, I love. Um, you know, for me, a lot of my performance is about the detail, but the piece de resistance of my kit is my, uh, my expedition suit, my summit suit. That item of clothing that is the closest thing I'll get to a space suit, and I love this. Um, it looks cool, I love it, but it is, make no bones about it, it is a life, it is a survival item, it's a survival suit, and, um, and that's as I see it. Summiting Everest is, uh, is hard enough as it is. But summiting without supplemental oxygen is, uh, is a very different undertaking. The way uh, our bodies adapt to the lack of oxygen in the air is to increase our red blood cell count and, uh, and that increases the viscosity of, of our blood. The human endeavour of summiting Everest and summiting Everest without supplemental oxygen is something that it really captivates me. My climb of Mount Everest is an experiment to gather new evidence in the hope of demonstrating how, with training, it's possible to keep the mind sharp by increasing blood flow to the brain, even when there's less oxygen for the brain to use. I'm hoping to show how anyone who does a little exercise can help prevent the onset of dementia. I've undergone an intensive training program at the Human Performance Lab in Reading to prepare me for the extreme altitude at which I'll be climbing. and go from the lens. Nikki Phillips is my performance director on the expedition, having worked with me on the majority of my World First projects. Come on, last set. Make it a good one. She is my go-to person when it comes to physical preparation. Richard's physical preparation, the effort that he puts into that for what would be a two-hour session of interval training is beyond what most athletes would do. And what's been quite interesting is that he trained amongst other high-performance athletes when he did that, and I think he really earned their respect when they saw what he was doing. Um, so if you can imagine the burn that you'd get just from walking up one hill very fast, and he's doing that again and again and again, and where he finds that extra strength, I don't know. This expedition is important not just to me, but to my mum and dad. We've experienced what it's like to have a close family friend diagnosed with dementia. My godfather battled with the disease. Having experienced this cruel disease so close to home, it's like somebody disintegrating from the inside out. And it just seems really cruel. Gavin Watkins and his wife Kim from Ebervale have been living with Gavin's dementia since he was diagnosed with the disease five years ago. At the moment, there is no cure. They reckon there's yes. one around the corner, mm. 
but uh, it's still a long way away and it, uh, we want to do as much as we can and I want to do it while I can before I've lost it completely and unable to. How did, how did it start, if you, if you don't mind me asking? Um, it was just, it was silly, stupid little things. Um, we went to our daughter's in Plymouth one day <laughs> and he forgot to lock the door. And he got back into the car and said, have I locked her door? Then there was repeating things over and over and he'd tell us the same story every weekend. The things that upset me so much is knowing that I'm going to forget my wife, my children and my grandson. I just know it's going to come and it's so upsetting when you realise you sit and think about that in your days, you know. That's the hardest part of it, is knowing that's going to happen and it means such a lot to me to keep it as long as I can. And that's where I fight to try and keep that going. Two years ago, I began working with the scientists at the University of South Wales in Ponypreeth. Professor Damien Bailey will be monitoring my performance on Mount Everest in a science lab at base camp. His research explores the relationship between oxygen and dementia. The personal thing that really drives me is that there is no curative treatment at the moment. So if you're diagnosed with it, we can't cure it. Um, people are working very hard. They're chasing after a cure, um, and it's proving very challenging. So the lion's share of our attention really is spent at trying to prevent it. We've got some evidence, and as the literature is suggesting, that exercise is probably the best medicine out there. Uh, we can put that on inside. Come on in, Ben. For the past 10 weeks, the team have been carrying out tests on me in a special chamber where the oxygen levels in the air have been reduced to simulate extreme altitude. We've been able to track Richard's uh, progress, physiologically, if you like, during, uh, during the training phases. The aim of this pilot study is to demonstrate that my acclimatization can compensate for the lack of oxygen on Mount Everest, that exercise can improve cognition even if there's less oxygen going to the brain. Richard has got a very comprehensive battery of tests that he'll be performing during the ascent to base camp, during the stay at base camp, and then, of course, um, above the Kumbu Icefall. Toughest of all will be a procedure where I have to anaesthetise my leg, making an incision with a scalpel five centimetres into the muscle, and then using a 15 centimetre needle to remove a sample of tissue. This muscle biopsy will be stored and later analysed to assess how my body uses oxygen during my ascent. All of this must be done whatever the weather at 29,000 feet and on my own. There's still a question mark over whether this is even possible with the limited time I'll have at the most extreme of altitudes. The tests will help in our understanding of the link between exercise and brain function. You don't see the brain when it's exercising. Of course, you can see the muscle or the heart or the lungs. You can see your chest moving up and down and you're breathing air in and out. But everybody forgets that the brain is in there as well. But we do know that there are parts of the brain, one specific part called the hippocampus, that actually shrinks with age. And uh, the question is, to what extent can we improve aspects of cognition with exercise by increasing blood flow and oxygen delivery to parts of the brain that need it more than most? Wales' highest mountain may only be 3,560 feet, but there's an intimate connection between Snowdon and Mount Everest. Not only was Everest itself named after a Welshman, the surveyor Sir George Everest, but it was here on Snowdon that Sir Edmund Hillary and the 1953 expedition team came to train. But the time for my training is over. I felt confident. I just had no idea what, what was ahead or what was in store for me, but you know, I'm confident of the toolbox that I had and the people I had around me to, to manage it, but I had every confidence I was gonna stand on the summit. Kathmandu very much is the gateway um, into the Himalaya. It's a real melting pot for not just local people, but climbers from all over the world. 
and it's an opportunity to distance myself actually from Wales and from, from the world here. Just the smells, the noises, the excitement, nerves, everything really. From Kathmandu, I'll fly into Lukla, the mountain town known as the gateway to the Himalayas. From there, my team and I will trek on foot first to Namchi Bazaar, and then on to Dingbushe as we acclimatize to the altitude. As part of my acclimatization strategy, I'll then attempt to summit the 20,300 feet of Island Peak. Returning to Dingbushe, I'll move on to Everest Base Camp before my ultimate goal, to summit Mount Everest herself without supplemental oxygen. My expedition team are Dr. Damien Bailey, Dr. Nicola Phillips, and operating the camera is Gareth Moreau. It's regarded as the scariest flight on the planet and, you know, Luckler Airport has been voted one of the most dangerous airports on the planet. <laughs> it's a really short runway. <laughs> Really short. <laughs> it's not for the faint-hearted. If 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 you had any anxiety around flying, it's definitely not the airport to visit. <laughs> Arriving in Lukla feels like the expedition is finally beginning. This place is real, not a simulated environment in a lab. We've got three days trekking ahead of us before we reach Namchi Bazaar. With our Sherpa, we'll be climbing from 9,383 feet to 11,290 feet. Some of the best bits about the track to base camp are the steel bridges that we have to cross, and they're pretty spectacular. I'll let you guys take a look for yourselves. We start our ascent of the Himalayan foothills, and straight away these steep slopes are enough to get the heart pumping. It's actually a crucial part of the climb. You know, from my experience, the, the better you acclimatize or the easier you take the first few days up to around three, four thousand meters, the, the better foundation you'll have above it. When we get around the corner, you've got Everest, and to the right Lotsey, then the real uh, the real beauty, the jewel, is uh, Anne de Blum. It's very special, it's isn't it? It's stunning. Um, but those first few days were wonderful because it was going to be an intense couple of months, so an opportunity for us all to to get to know each other and to, you know to bond further before before the the tough times came. <laughs> it's day four of the expedition, and already my team is gelling. There's no room for standing on ceremony. It's share and share alike, especially when it comes to luxury items. I got myself into trouble. I left three toilet rolls in the toilet. <laughs> oh, were those I yours? Leaving, I kept leaving them. Yeah. One in each. I might have found. Thanks, mate. I had yeah, the, uh, yeah, you had a pleasant, good, you had uh, pleasant a... arsewipe this morning. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate that. You had a freebie there, didn't you? Yeah. That's OK. I, I did think, I thought, thinking, heck, this place is nice. <laughs> three toilet rolls. Yeah. Well, let's just leave you in. And we're, we're quits now for the, uh, for the beat boots here. I'll let you use some of mine later for that then. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> oh, you used it as well. Because yeah, yeah. I thought, oh, Tell you what, uh, unbelievable. <laughs> people were running into the loo to use my free toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> Can't believe it. Can you it? <laughs> yeah, I might have taken a few <laughs> sheets as well. <laughs> that is bang out of order. Uh, that's outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
Slice is done. I'm ready to go. Let's do this. Any marks? I'm right behind you. <laughs> Throughout the expedition, Damien will be monitoring my blood and brain function as we progress ever higher. People that, that are acutely exposed to this altitude would get very, very sick uh, very, very quickly. And it, you know, again demonstrates that we're acclimatizing very well. And, and that's the objective here, is to acclimatize Richard ahead of the summit bid. Now, for some people, um, if you climb too high and too quickly and you get too cold, you can't actually acclimatized to that stress and you actually break down and these symptoms really are known as acute mountain sickness so acute mountain sickness really um, encapsulates a severe headache and with that comes feeling sick um, a lack of appetite and uh, difficulty breathing and uh, just not sleeping very well so it has a really negative impact just as a migraine would have a very negative impact on you at sea level very similar in altitude This slow acclimatization is a key process for preparing my body for Mount Everest. The more my body adapts, the longer I'll be able to stand on the summit. The locals are used to the effects altitude has on them, but for us lowlanders, readying ourselves physically takes time. Preparation of the mind is also key but I'm about to take part in a tradition that few climbers are privileged to experience, the preparation of my spirit. It's a tradition, and it's a really important tradition, actually, for the Sherpas and the Nepalese people, that uh, the local Lama blesses not just themselves, but their equipment before the summit of Everest to wish them good luck and keep them in good health. The last few years, it's, uh, it's become even more poignant and even more important a tradition. You know, whatever your beliefs are, you, you can't help but feel something special about here. It's a very spiritual place. You know, I know that uh, I'm on the prayer sheets at Mum's church back home, but I know it's really special and uh, just wish I knew what you were saying. <laughs> I thought it was quite funny when he laughed at my name, but uh, it's not the first time someone's laughed at me. Probably won't be the last. Today is the first of our major ascents. In two hours, we begin our climb to Island Peak. Amazing how many friends you have when you've got uh, toilet paper, or as Damien knows, when you uh, are sharing quilted toilet paper <laughs> and been owing to him. We leave today for Island Peak, which is probably about a three day climb. It's our last opportunity, really, to get the, the data collection nailed, so. If it goes well, amazing. If it doesn't, we need to go back to the drawing board, don't we? And I know that's the nature of things out here, but uh, yeah, a little bit uh, apprehensive, if I'm being honest. <laughs> I was just sort of laughing, because without really knowing it, I've been really OCD. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> yeah, but I, have, I, I genuinely haven't even been aware of it. 
<laughs> no, that goes there, that goes there. No, that doesn't go there, that's got to go there. Yeah. Um, it's quite alarming, though, when you see it, like, in a third person. But, hey. <laughs> Yeah. We shall. See you on the way back down. Go easy on the lava. <laughs> So over the last week and a half, um, we've been gradually increasing in altitude, um, going up a little, down a little, up a little again, and so on. Um, today now will be the first time where Richard goes up into pretty significant altitude. Island Peak is around 6,100, I think, something like that. And the purpose is to practise collecting scientific data with all the, um, the difficulties that there are when you're not doing it in a lab, basically. Ahead of me is High Camp. As I get closer, the clean, crisp mountain air carries with it a very welcome scent, something you wouldn't expect to smell at 18,400 feet. Pretty incredible what uh, Ramesh and his team can make on the side of a mountain. What's for lunch today, Ramesh? It's really humbling, actually. You know, humbling in the true sense of the word. They're on the side of a mountain, uh, five, five, just over 5,000 meters, and uh, you know, we're we're in the presence of a really, really talented chef. And I'm here for a very specific goal. But every now and again, these surreal moments really just, just, just take my breath away. You know, it's uh, it's such a special place. Ah, yeah, uh, Paul. What's Ramesh cooked up today? We have uh, rara -ra noodle soup. It's pretty awesome, really. It's super noodles, but. Ma. More super. Thanks, <laughs> 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 <Thank you>, <laughs> As night falls, even the high winds around my tent are no distraction from the challenge ahead. It's moments like these when my mind starts to wander. I think the thing that I'm most concerned about is the... the blood sample from my earlobe. Ironically, on paper, it's the easiest thing. The biopsy should be the hardest bit, but actually, I'm really confident at the biopsy. Um, I'm confident in my ability to perform that on my leg. I can see it, whereas I can't see my ear. I guess it's the unknown that makes, that makes this the adventure. I guess that's what inspires me to, uh, you know, to work at it. There are only a few hours to get some sleep, and it's not long before I'm out of my tent again and climbing. There's two reasons for starting so early in the morning. The first reason is the, the early part um, of the glacier, the approach in, as well as some of the crevasse crossings are safer because it's colder and the ice is more stable. Um, and the second reason is not being able to see how far you've got to go is always a bit of a bonus as well. <laughs> but there is another plus point to getting up so early. The view. here at this time of the morning are quite literally breathtaking.
But as intoxicating as the view is, there's a sobering feeling that danger lies ahead as we edge closer to Island Peak. The head wall is where the real challenge begins. Fixed lines hang down more than 650 feet of steep, poor quality ice. The head wall section of Island Peak, it's a tough few hours. And it's tough because physically it's hard. You know, you're just under 6,000 meters. The air is thin. Your body isn't getting as much oxygen as it would at sea level. And everything is considerably harder. You, you've got a fixed line that's there that you, you, you put a certain amount of trust into it, but there are points in the mountain where there are 10, 11, 12 ropes all leading into one fixed point. And your, your option is to decide which rope looks the newest. Entrusting my safety to someone else's rope is an uncomfortable feeling. But then I'm met by one thing I dislike even more, a crevasse and a rickety ladder crossing. Uh, give me a bit of slack on this one. Yeah, I don't like crevasses. <laughs> the penultimate leg of my 737 challenge was on Denali, also known as Mount McKinley. I had what could have been a, a very dangerous, if not fatal, crevasse fall where I fell about seven metres down um, through a melted snow bridge and my fall was only broken by landing on a ledge. And yeah, it, it, it very quickly turned into a, uh, a very dangerous situation. There are a handful of ladder crossings spanning open crevasses in the early part of this section. It's a useful reminder of what's to come on the icefall in the western coombe of Mount Everest. My left foot is stuck. You can imagine you're balancing on, on a ladder, on two ladders that are tied together using climbing rope. With just a momentary lapsing concentration, I've put my crampon down in a place where actually it's become wedged between two runs and it is absolutely horrific. You're, you're balanced on this moving, um, this moving ladder, so you have to sort of really gingerly try and loosen the crampon to, uh, to get off. It's not nice, no. No, I don't enjoy that at all. I can't imagine many people would. With so many things that, that, that could have gone wrong, I, I feel really strongly about taking a moment to, to breathe it in and to really acknowledge the achievement. As with all of my expeditions, it's the challenge and the physical exertion that makes the taste of success all the more sweet. Fly in the Welsh flag and that's really important too, because it was in a really, really significant and important milestone in the project. It helps build confidence, momentum, and it helps, it helps you visualize what you're actually trying to achieve. And, and it's a really proud moment. It's easy to get caught up in the moment of summiting Island Peak, but I'm here for a very specific reason. This is my dry run, and I've got to complete the blood breath, cognition, and tissue sampling fast. If it goes wrong on Mount Everest in what's known as the death zone, and I'm there for too long, it could very well be catastrophic. First thing we do is going to be application there. Then that's going to take two minutes. Most climbers that get to the top can only stay there for a few minutes before they are forced to retreat. The same applies to me, but I'll have no supplementary oxygen and I must complete my tests. Damien, how do I get this working, mate? So, what do you want to do? Just press. 
slippery in and out. It would be how many times? Just steady state, so a few times, <coughs> nice and slowly. It's good. And relax. So then there's the oximeter. What's more, the weather here on Island Peak is perfect. The chances of equally favourable weather on Mount Everest are slim. Now, the analgesic in the thigh, unzip, re-zip it again, and then it's three, six, that now. It's completely anaesthetised and it'll take five minutes to activate or to take effect. In those five minutes now, it's the... Elo. You can attempt it now? I can I can do it now if you want. Yeah, let's give it a shot. Let's give it a shot. I'm starting to feel anxious. No matter how many times I've practiced this in the lab, I knew it would take longer in reality. What bothers me is just how long it's taking. As part of my acclimatization, my body has produced a far higher concentration of red cells in my blood. I knew this was going to happen. Let me just try it one more time. Making it thicker and almost impossible to sample. And then just turn your head. There we go, I see. It didn't go according to plan. And, I mean, I had some serious concerns. It highlighted that some of the things that I felt I could do on my own I needed help. I needed another set of hands. We were up there for a long time. There was just no way that I could spend that time on the summit of Everest. We've now spent more than 30 minutes on this peak. And what's more, I haven't yet completed the cognitive tests. At sea level, this usually takes eight to 10 minutes. Altitude inhibits the brain function, so it's going to take me longer. It's one thing going through it night after night in a tent or at home, but actually it, it's a completely different thing doing it at 6,000 meters. We, we couldn't do that on the summit. It, it, I, I'd be putting my, my life at risk. Although this is only a dry run, these results along with others collected on Mount Everest will be analyzed back in the lab in Wales. After the stresses of the test procedure, the whole team is reunited at Namchi Bazaar, and we move on towards base camp. As we hike through the Kumbu Valley, I feel a million miles away from the modern world. Then, from out of nowhere springs civilization, or the closest thing to it on this mountain, base camp. Hey, how's it going? How's it, guys? How are you? I'm good, mate. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Nice you to right? see you. Yeah, yeah, pretty good. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> hey, cheers, mate. <laughs> How are you doing? Hey, good to see you. Good to see you too. Oh, yeah. good. How are you doing? And the paradox of, of base camp is that having tracked up the Kumbu Valley, getting more and more remote uh, with each settlement, you then arrive at base camp and it's got infrastructure there that is unlike any other part of the Kumbu Valley. It's like a, a bustling metropolis of, of tents. You know, there's even very limited Wi-Fi signal there, which you can't get at other places along uh, along the trek into base camp. I can't believe you bought safety pins. That's next level, mate. Fair play. Oh, 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 sorry. Oh, fuck. What was that? Oh, <laughs> I was on the pain of my ass. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> this is Richard Park playing up again, isn't it? They couldn't resist that. put me on a sweat now. <laughs> it's giving me a headache. We've all... ...blessed the, uh, the flag and the tent. Yeah. And you're a very big part of this team, so... Whiskey? Whiskey. Oh, I don't a know. Little, little. Uh, just a little bit, just a little bit. <laughs> Oh, no, I did Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ben. Thank, thank you very much. Spirits are high. After two years of preparation, we are finally at the starting line for this expedition. The weather conditions are looking good, and we're all feeling confident. However, my thoughts keep returning to my experience on Island Peak. David Hamilton, our expedition leader, arrives at our tent, and our conversation yeah. compounds my concerns. I don't want to be over dramatic, but the last oxygenless ascent of Everest that I'm aware of resulted in the person dying, and the gaping hole is your mountaineering consultant. If you had, you know, a guide who'd been on the top five or six times before, ideally one with medical training walking along beside you, the whole project would just fit. Information came to me that I shouldn't have been privy to in that moment. Although you're trying to exert yourself to your maximum, you've always got to have this little regulatory mechanism. Am I overstepping the mark? Because if you do, the consequences can be fatal. It was right that the information came to me, but it's, it's really difficult to, you know, to be told that I'm very close to my mortality, but yet still be expected to make rational, coherent, Decisions. And to me, that's the big weakness. That's what really worries me, is you up there, you know, expending yourself possibly into areas where your judgment may be impaired and nobody else there to, to help. I mean, if anything, David's helped you sort of maybe visualise that moment in time when, when you've really got to decide whether you can keep going forward or not? Um... I don't think he has helped me, no. Um, although it's very different to this, there are not many people on the planet that have skied more solo Antarctic miles than I have. Um, you know, this is the end of a really meticulous development cycle, and although relatively I have less experience than David here on Everest, I am very confident of, of my own abilities to make those difficult decisions. I've I've proven it. You know, one of the most difficult decisions I've had to make was to abort my first solo Antarctic expedition just 100 kilometers from the South Pole after battling the elements for 42 days. I believe that I have the right balance of humility and defiance and uh, respect for the environment that I'm in. Warning heeded, but undeterred, and after five days at base camp, I get my head down for one last good night's sleep before we push on to camp one. I feel really good at this point. My acclimatization strategy has worked really well and, you know, I'm probably one of the only people here at base camp that isn't coughing uncontrollably. Um, and I'm in good health, but it's uh, it's about to get really real. From this point on, it's just me, my Sherpa, and Gareth on camera. The Kumbu Icefall is one of the most dynamic, fast-moving glaciers I've ever been on. You can almost hear it creaking and grinding and cracking underneath you, and from day to day, it can change overnight with big chunks of glacier dropping off or crevasses opening or filling in. It's not a part of the climb that, that I'd want to hang around in. In order to, to manage some of the, the risk of that section and to be as safe as possible, it requires you to move as 
quickly as possible. Which is why there are a lot of accidents on the mountain because a lot of people are working at their capacity. More than 270 people have died on this mountain in the last 50 years. Nearly 100 of them in the last 10. As well as the ice fall, avalanches and falling into crevasses, the effects of altitude have claimed many climbers. It's not about conquering the mountain. It's, it's more often than not about, you know, conquering yourself and managing that internal dialogue and the emotional roller coaster that that you go through and it can be brutal You know, we've been really good mates so far and, you know, <laughs> our friendship is getting stronger and, you know, we've got a big couple of weeks ahead of us and I really feel like the kick in the morale nuts now might just be irreversible. Too much. <laughs> just thinks, oh, I can smell that. Yeah. I can smell that. Do you want to see it, though? Do you want to see it? It's like, it, yeah. Has it got rice in, too? Oh, noodles. <laughs> <laughs> can I see your spoon, mate? God. <laughs> That's, uh, I believe that's potato, vaguely. Wow. It's definitely, there's something pink wow. and something yellow and something white, so I'm just gonna base it on that. Oh, that looks amazing. No, seriously, that actually looks really good. No, I, I, fe <laughs> I, felt, I felt bad earlier, but I don't know. No, it looks amazing, it looks amazing. You nearly sound sincere there. <sighs> I'll try and describe what I'm eating. It's basically just... Rubber. Yeah, tree. <laughs> tree rubber, no taste, no season. It's the sort of thing that somebody would eat if if they just were the most fussiest person in the world. <laughs> oh, but 500 calories, which is about what we need to get. Yeah, comfy. yeah, yeah, and of course, yeah. Yeah, you know, you just keep focusing on the positives. <laughs> Just, just keep, just hang it on something, hang it on anything. Your turn. Let's see, let's see how yours goes. Okay. I mean, Look at those noodles. Oh, the, the, the big chicken breast and the sweet corn. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> chicken <it's>... breast. <laughs> best meal ever. <laughs> it's the best meal I've had today. Yeah. Not really selfie kind of. Good forearm strength, by the way. Oh yeah. Wow. That's my right hand. <laughs> Things can go sideways pretty really quickly, and. Uh... And the climb, you know, the climb to Camp 2 was a really good example of that. This is a high-risk avalanche area. You can make decisions that minimise the risk of, of avalanches, but they're still pretty unpredictable. And, uh, and one moment to be looking forward to uh, the coffee at Camp 2, you know, having got through arguably the, the, the most dangerous part uh, of the climb to Camp 2, to, for, for, you, you know, to in a second to, uh, to have that. It was, you know, it was, pretty, it was pretty scary. Um, 
I don't think I've ever moved so fast uh, above 6,000 metres. <laughs> With the avalanche still fresh in our minds, we arrive at Camp 2. My acclimatization strategy means we rest here for two days before we can carry on. And surprisingly, there's very little to do when you're perched on the side of the world's largest mountain. <laughs> Put all my clothes back on. <laughs> you get a bit stir crazy, really. Oh yeah. You know, it's uh, it comes to something when the highlight of your day is is a wet wipe, the wet wipe shower. Oh, we missed that. You didn't. You yeah. didn't tell me you were doing that. We didn't get it on camera. So give us a tour of of, uh, of our, well our tent, I suppose. Um, actually, I, you, you've tidied up considering that we're filming. Uh, well, I kind of, I kind of knew that we'd maybe have guests in the form of, <laughs> form of a camera, so I've, um, I'm a lot tighter than my oh, usual. Yeah. But yeah, you can see I've got a selection of cleansing handy wipes, my first aid kit, my sat phone. Do you got the toilet roll on the Walkman so I can listen to music while I'm out of shit? <laughs> Right above me in the morning is the, the tablet, so that I've got no excuses to do the cognitive testing. I've got a little bedside table here, but that's for personal stuff. I can't, talk, I can't show you that. Um, really? I'm not, I, I don't even know about that. No? You, you've got a bedside table? Well, it's the lid of my rucksack, if you can see over there. Uh, yeah. You see that, the lid there? Oh, yeah. Um, and then you've got like little personal items in there, have you? Yeah, I've got my my little letters and stuff. Oh, like. I'm just really impressed that you've tidied your <laughs> side of the tent, knowing that you're going to be filming it. Yeah, well, the thing about my side of the tent is I haven't got half the stuff you have. I don't know how I get. Basically, I get by baby wipes and a sat phone. <laughs> <laughs> That's home. That's it, yeah. <laughs> After two days rest, we're ready to climb again. Tomorrow, it's a climb to Camp 3. And then the day after, I climb to the Yellow Band and back down. Emma and I are going to leave Camp 2 at around five, six o'clock tomorrow, so signing off now, get some chateau. The following day, we awake to a serious problem. The picture said all, but explain what's, what's going on. Well, this morning we've had a cruel twist of mountain fate. After all the preparations to move up to Camp 3 this morning, she's just completely shut down. We've had quite a lot of snowfall overnight, but we've got very low cloud and, and actually white out conditions, which it, it's more the visibility than the snow. I'm confident, I think we're both confident to move in uh, this type of snowfall, but I've got another day. In your, <laughs> in, in your palace? Yeah, in my, in my palace, yeah. Sometimes, when you're in the mountains, one cruel blow follows another. And for me, things go from bad to worse. You know, Nikki and Damien have known this for the last two days, yeah. but we've had poor comms, yeah. and I think both of them felt it was quite a difficult 
thing to try and convey on a crackly line. Damien and uh, our doc were looking through some of your blood test results and alarm bells started ringing. You have arrived here fantastically acclimatized. You have more red blood cells than anyone else on this mountain, which from a point of view of climbing a mountain is great. Yeah. However, in one of the emails I've read, your blood is like treacle. Yeah. And that puts you at a very high risk of some medical yeah. events. Sure. The severity of my situation becomes clear when I'm eventually told that my condition could very well be life-threatening. I think the recommendation is that you descend to base camp, they repeat the tests, and then bringing in all the accumulated expertise, try to help you to achieve your project without unnecessary risk to you. We need to address the safety implications before you climb any further. Sure. Safety is paramount to me, and I needed more information to understand my situation fully. You've just dropped a bombshell on me. <laughs> um, are you suggesting that I descend? Well, I can descend now. This news is brutal. First, we are delayed by the weather, and now I'm forced to retreat to base camp. In terms of the expedition, it could be a killer blow. Over the next few days, I'm subject to a series of tests to check how my body, and more importantly, my blood, is performing at extreme altitude. What we've identified is that his ability to make red blood cells is exceptionally good. In fact, it's so good that it's actually raised a bit of a red flag. When the blood makes so many red blood cells, it can become quite sludgy. So blood moves through blood vessels very slowly because it's so thick, they've made so many red blood cells. And of course, that makes them more prone to heart attacks and stroke. So this is the litmus test now, really. This will give us a very cold and sober look at Richard's bloods, and then from that, we can make a, make a decision. The blood tests show a high concentration of red blood cells, meaning that I'm at a very high risk of having a stroke or developing heart complications if I were to continue climbing the mountain. I literally am in the fucking best shape of my life. Yep, and that's the irony, isn't it? It's just fucking brutal yeah. because yeah. Oh, yeah. I, 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 you know, I, I mean, physically I'm in the best shape of my life. Psychologically, I probably am in the best shape of my life. Yeah. I'll be honest, it's, it's, as, as time is going on, and I don't mean long, we're talking hours and days, but literally, I, it's really fucking with my head. As cruel as it is, due to the risk of my blood clotting and the potential for complications, my decision to cut the expedition and the experiment short is the right one. From a positive aspect, Damien was able to collect the data that he needed to do for the project. So as far as the project is concerned, we have all the data that was the main part of the study. Um, Richard was going to collect some more data at the summit, but that was going to be a nice added extra. We don't have that anymore. So from that perspective, you can say the project is a success. But for Richard, from a personal perspective, it's just really sad because he, you know, he set himself out as a challenge and, and I know the science project was the main part, but on a, on a personal level, it's never good when you don't achieve what maybe you set out to achieve. Um, and, and that's a bitter pill to swallow. When Richard came down off the mountain, um, you know, I could certainly sympathize with him and, uh, you know, he was distraught, you know, incredibly disappointed. You know, it's been two years in the build-up, training for this expedition, physically, psychologically. Uh, you know, it's, it's safety before summit. And I really stand by that. And, uh, you know, I, feel, I would feel 
um, you know, desperately responsible if anything well untoward advised. were to happen. Um, I think over the last couple of days when he's had an opportunity to reflect um, on his safety, I think it's become very clear to him that this was the absolute right decision to take. Moving forward would have been irresponsible and selfish. Um, doesn't make it any easier for me because you know, I'm an ambitious person and I came here with an objective and uh, I've not been allowed to even attempt it, let alone attempt it and fail. Success is going home. Success is going back to my family. Uh, and, you know, success is all the people around me being safe as well. We've still collected really exciting and groundbreaking data, measurements. From a scientific point of view, it has been a success. It might take a while for me to really believe that, though. <laughs> Standing on the summit of Everest is, is a memory, is a moment, is a feeling that will live with me forever. I can still feel the view. It's a very primal sense of insignificance. You, you, I mean, there are very few places where you can see the curvature of the Earth on the planet. And so I had confidence that with the right preparation, the right training, I could stand on the summit without supplemental oxygen. And what? <laughs> What troubles me is I still believe I could have. I'll never know. That's what gives me sleepless nights. I don't think about it as much as I used to, but it still, it still, it still troubles me. Dementia is the fastest growing illness in the Western world. And we all at some level have been touched by it and there are still no known cures. Knowing that I'm going to forget my wife, my children, and my grandson, it's so upsetting when you realise, you sit and think about that. Here in Wales, we are leading in some areas of research into this disease, and some of the results already show that as a result of the acclimatisation process, We've not just offset some of the cognitive decline, but we've actually improved my cognition on the mountain, which, which is, it's awesome. I feel very proud that Project Everest will be able to add to the ongoing research. <laughs>